perfection of taxation such as ever home in America. Cutting through the static of the tax world, it's Simply Tax. Brought to you by BKD CPAs and Advisors. Everyone needs a trusted advisor. Who's yours? Now here's your host, Damian Martin. Hello and welcome to a very special episode of Simply Tax. As you probably already figured out, I'm a bit of a tax geek. So you might imagine just how excited I was to sit down, talk tax, and do a crossover episode with David Stewart, the host of the well-known and highly respected Tax Notes Talk podcast, as well as the editor-in-chief of Tax Notes Today International, which is an online daily publication for tax analysts. I have a lot of appreciation for the hardworking tax reporters and editors like Dave that help keep the tax world turning with their coverage on the latest tax developments. And that's why I'm excited to share with you on the podcast today, another installment of our Working in Tax series, where we take an inside look at the day in the life of an international tax reporter, get the latest on the OEC's BEPS project, and of course, since no interview of a host of another podcast about taxes would be complete without it, explore what it's like to host a podcast about taxes. Be sure to check out the show notes of this episode, which you'll find at bkd.com slash simplytax for the link to the simultaneously released episode of the Tax Notes Talk podcast, where I offer my post-TCGA lessons from last year, discuss how this experience has shaped this season so far, share the one thing I wish the IRS could clarify about the TCGA and more, including what I'm focusing on this year to stay sane as a tax professional during the tax season. The show notes also provide links to the resources mentioned during our discussion, offer more about Dave, and explain why we've included a picture of him, along with Chief Tax Notes Today International Correspondent Stephanie Johnston and Pompey the Pekingese, dressed up for Halloween. And one final note, before I turn it over to Dave to hear how he came to write about, analyze, and report on taxes, I have to say I'm pretty impressed with myself for resisting the urge to make punny international tax references throughout this intro. I guess you could even say, I beat it. All right, here's the very tax able David Stewart. Well, I came to uh, to work for uh, tax analysts uh, uh, directly out of law school. And and actually, you know, while I was in law school, I, I had two realizations that I hadn't expected. One was that I really didn't want to go out and work at a firm. I don't know. There were just uh, several several reasons in my, in my mind at the time. The other realization was that I liked tax. I had originally kind of focused on uh, securities law and was, uh, was thinking that that was going to be my life. And toward the end of law school, I uh, started taking a few tax courses. And sort of fatefully, I took an international tax course with Tom Field, the uh, person who founded Tax Analysts. Yeah. And as law school wrapped up and this job came open at uh, Tax Analysts where uh, I spent six months uh, writing court summaries in the federal department uh, before becoming a reporter. And I really took to the, the reporting side of it. I really enjoyed that. And I did that for uh, about eight years, uh, mostly focusing on transfer pricing. It was something that I wouldn't have thought of just a couple years earlier. You know, I wouldn't even have thought of going into tax law uh, just a few years earlier. Hmm. But it was just having the right courses, the right professors possibly, that pushed me in that direction. And a bit of fate. And I wound up here. And I really liked uh, talking about uh, transfer pricing. It's just a, an, an interesting area with so many moving parts. Uh, I also covered uh, VAT for a while uh, mm -hmm. in addition to that, where you might not think of them as, as, as being similar, but there's a lot of parts that rhyme between the two of them, a lot of interesting discussions about what things really are and, uh, and values. So I, I covered that for a while, and then um, a few years back, I was lucky enough to become the, the editor-in-chief of the international publication, and I've been doing that since. You know, what, was there a, a particular moment where you just said, yeah, this is – I do like tax. I mean, do you, do you recall that? I mean, was, there, was it more of just a – I guess, how, how did you become aware of that? Because I feel like that's always the question that I get from, from people in the tax field is, how did you know that this was for you? I think it was a moment of actual regret rather than a moment mm -hmm. of knowing this was right for me. Okay. It was a moment of saying, why didn't I go into this earlier? Because this is actually really interesting. You know, recognizing, looking back at, at my undergrad and thinking, oh, I could have taken courses where I would have been more prepared for this, you know, instead of coming to it just this, you know, just a few years later. But mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. it was still just this moment of thinking, 
if I'd found this earlier, I would have directed my uh, directed my path toward that. Now, since I was directing my path towards securities, maybe that would have just like sent me on the wrong direction anyway, and I'd be a securities lawyer right now working in a firm. But uh, just the 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 confluence of events just ended up uh, with with me becoming a tax geek. There you go. Yeah. So, what is the day in the life of a uh, I guess as a reporter, and then again, and then congratulations, and you know the role of being editor in chief. What is that like? Well, as a reporter uh, in in international specifically, you you have various areas to keep track of. Now, uh, here at Tax Notes, we have two types of reporter. We have reporters that come from a journalism background, and then we have reporters who come from a legal background. And the way we usually divide up responsibilities is the the reporter background people have beats they they keep track of on kind of a geographic basis, mm -hmm. while the legal reporters come in with a subject matter to keep track of. So I was a the transfer pricing reporter for a number of years. And essentially, you you wake up and try to find out, oh, what happened in Europe last night? You know, like what happened in Europe while, while I was still asleep? Mm -hmm. And the challenge that you run into is that by the time I found out what happened in Europe, they're getting close to wrapping up their day. So a lot of reporting is getting in touch with people and asking them, well, what does this really mean? You know, can you give me a, a sense of, of where things are going in this area? And so you start out the day in a race to try and reach out to people and try to catch them before their day finishes out. Then on the other end of the day, around about 4 o'clock, you're waiting to find out if the IRS is about to release new regulations in your area mm -hmm. uh, that you will then have to get a story out within the next two hours and try to maybe get a hold of somebody to talk to them about it if you can, because there's bits that, you know, I can I can read the regulation, but I need to talk to somebody who works in that area that can tell me what this means to them. And yeah. that way I can tell our other readers what this, you know, get a, a good sense of what this will mean for the other readers. So the international reporter has kind of a long day to keep track of. But it's manageable. It's not. It's not extreme. And the the regulations dropping in the in the afternoon are while they happen from time to time. They're not every day. Sure. Sure. Um, so it's a lot of spending time trying to get a hold of people. It's it's a lot of looking around to make sure that you're not missing things because that's the that's the the fear that happens uh, mm. to the to the reporter every day is that they miss something important in their beat area. Um, so we all come up with with our own mechanisms to make sure that we capture all that stuff. We have sources that will let will clue us in to, uh, to things that are going on. And and today, as, as strange as it may seem, Twitter is a great resource for finding out what's going on out there because tax Twitter is a marvelous community of people that are constantly talking about these issues. Yeah. And when something comes up in Europe, there's a discussion about it. And that actually allows us to, you know, Oftentimes we would have found the same information, but it's good to be able to see as a check to make sure that we're that we're on top of the stories that people are talking about. Yeah. Well, and I'm glad you made that that mention. When the microphone was flipped the other way here earlier and we were, you know, doing an interview for for your podcast, which by the way is TNT, <laughs> I, you never realized, which is pretty tech, but tax notes talk. That's uh, branding there. Yeah, it is. That's that's, that's pretty uh, I like that, you know. I, I don't know that I even initially caught that. I'm like, wow, that's uh, that's that's really good. But Tax Twitter is an excellent resource. I mean, again, you have to a good one for monitoring the changes, right? I mean, you have to you have to obviously go in and, and, and dig deeper, but it's it's also it's, it's a fantastic community, and, and I've enjoyed becoming a part of that and then contributing to it as well. So yeah, and and it's great for me now that I'm in the the editor in chief role mm -hmm. because I don't have that day to day monitoring very specific things. Yeah, I, I, I trust in my reporters who are, are excellent at finding the at finding this, these bits of information. But every once in a while. You know, as the boss, I like to be able to say, hey, I heard about this thing. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes I, that I'm sourcing that to tax Twitter. But, there you go. Yeah. 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 Well, so, so yeah, tell me how that's maybe changed other than perhaps adding a little bit more tax Twitter as the editor in chief. <laughs> you know, there are things that are a little bit different as the day in life uh, being in that role. Well, it, it's a it's a strange uh, straddling the day with this it's this relatively long day uh, in in the international realm. So my morning is basically emailing back and forth with all the reporters and getting everything lined up for what's being covered during the day. So the mm -hmm. stories that we know about in the morning, we're getting lined up and we're saying, okay, follow this thread, do this, you know, checking in, making sure that everybody is on the same page with what they're expecting to deliver that day. And then later in the day, there's a bit of a gap between uh, the events of my day. Then later in the day, when the reporters start filing, then uh, you know we have a, a, a talented team of news editors that that handle 
uh, most of the editing process. And uh, you know, I'm reading through the copy as it's coming in to to make sure that we're that we're all on the same page. And 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 also, I, I will help out with some of the newer reporters and as they're as they're learning. I, I part of my role is as an educator for the mm-hmm. people that come in. Because they, they may be uh, a lawyer, but they may not be uh, super well versed in some of the areas that they have to cover uh, when they come here. I'm apparently known for my lecture on how VAT works, mm. and I apparently have to give that every time someone comes in because VAT is not very well known to to U.S. practitioners. Right. And and over the years, I've developed a, apparently what's called a lecture on ah. it. It does involve uh, uh, one chart that I use, and uh, and so I tend to give that whenever a new reporter comes in. Usually, let them uh, work for a couple of weeks before I do it because I really don't want to scare them away too early. <laughs> yeah, no, it's it charts at all. It sounds like a pretty good, uh, that, that actually sounds like a, something I might actually enjoy one, one of these days. We'll have to figure out, a, <laughs> well, uh, get the lecture worked in here I, somewhere. Well, I've learned that um, that whenever I seem to start losing the person I'm talking to about VAT, I start talking about Pringles. Ah, okay. Because there's a very important case in the UK about what a Pringle is. <laughs> Oh, you know, once you pop that story, you can't, you can't, right. I mean, you can't, you, you can't, can't stop. stop no. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess speaking of maybe fascinating, but yet uh, very complex areas, you know, I know that you've extensively covered and you've had on the podcast and as, as well as uh, Tech Notes Today International with the OECD's uh, BEPS project and kind yeah. of following that. So maybe you could just give a little bit of a, a background on it, um, where, where we are and really what that's meant for perhaps even your career kind of as you've been following it and reporting on it. When I first started here, when I first started as a reporter, like the big issue that we were discussing was uh, a bank secrecy, hmm. you know, Swiss banking accounts and that, that sort of issue. Uh, Bradley Birkenfeld was, was a major figure as that was, as that was all coming to a head. And then what we noticed a lot of, a lot coming out from the UK interest in how much money corporations were paying in various jurisdictions I, I think in part that was a reaction to the austerity measures following the downturn. Mm-hmm. And then you started hearing these terms thrown around in uh, in general conversation, the, 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 the double Irish with a Dutch sandwich uh, sort of concepts. It was clearly starting to come to a head. Uh, uh, incidentally, um, we're, we have a Halloween party here at, at Tax Analyst, and one year, Stephanie Johnston, one of my reporters, and I uh, came as the double Irish Dutch sandwich. <laughs> I, we're going to have to find a picture. I, 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 I will share it with you. Okay, we can, we okay. Can, we can, you can add it to the we show notes po- if you like. Okay, yeah, all right. Let's, let's go. All right. Yeah. <laughs> I like it. Uh, it involves a Pekingese. Hmm. Uh, we'll just put that out there so people okay. have to click on it. Okay. <laughs> so... In, in, in 2013, uh, the OECD put out its BEPS project. And this BEPS project was, was, it was 15 action items that were supposed to deal with all these major issues of companies apparently not paying their fair share according to, to, to what people were saying. And action one was to deal with the taxation of the digital economy. Mm-hmm. Well, about, you know, I, I, I covered the, the BEPS project as it was going through. I covered the, the transfer pricing portion of it. I, I went to Paris for the consultations. It was, a, it was a fascinating time. And they dealt with a lot of issues. But this action one said, we're going to do more work on this later. It, it, it came to the conclusion that there's not really something called the digital economy and that, that a lot of these issues will be dealt with by the other BEPS action items, um, but that we'll, we'll look into it in a later project. And so now we're the BEPS project is fin- finished out in 2015. Now we have this, this new project. The, the Inclusive Framework is, is doing its project that some people call BEPS 2.0, but I, I know that that's apparently a controversial name we've heard uh, mm-hmm. in, in some areas. But the official name is too long for a headline, so we've used BEPS 2.0 here. And this new, this new project has the two-pillar approach, the unified approach, where Pillar 1 offers new nexus and allocation uh, rules and pillar two does a global minimum tax, and as it was proposed back in October, that was just a secretariat document. That was just the OECD leadership that put that out. So mm-hmm. they began consultations on that. Then, in a- after the consultations were were complete on pillar one, a grenade was basically thrown into the room. It was a new letter from uh, U.S. Treasury. Stephen Mnuchin sent a letter to the to the OECD saying that they wanted to alter the, the, the trajectory of this pillar one towards safe harbor rules. And while everyone's trying to sort out what that really means, uh, this project keeps turning forward. And the inclusive framework was set to meet in late January. 
when they did, the, the major outcome of, of that event, it was a, a release they made on uh, January 31st, was that the inclusive framework has adopted this approach, this two-pillar approach, as the approach that they will be using going forward. So it's no longer just the secretariat's idea. It's now the official idea of the inclusive framework. And the inclusive framework is the OECD member states plus a very large portion uh, of non-member states. So it's still really up in the air. They're, they, they're still claiming, they're still proposing that this will be done by the end of the year, as it was originally said that they would do back in the in the BEPS final report on the digital economy. Mm -hmm. But there's a lot of open questions about it. One of the major open questions under Pillar 1 is whether you can get to mandatory arbitration, which the U.S. would support in order as an enforcement mechanism for, the, for all these different ways of allocating income. Countries like India don't want to accept mandatory arbitration because they're, they're worried about how that's going to turn out for them. Then you have Pillar 2, this, this global minimum tax, where certain fundamental questions of how it's going to be designed haven't been answered yet. Questions about carve-outs, questions about blending. You can blend on an entity basis, you can blend on a jurisdiction basis, or you can blend on a global basis. And which one of those blending mechanisms you choose determines what kind of minimum tax this is. Is it an entity-level minimum tax? Is it a jurisdiction-level minimum tax? Is it a global minimum tax? Each of those have different trade-offs. Each uh, The entity level is, is a lot of compliance. The jurisdiction level is less compliance. The global is fairly straightforward, but it doesn't necessarily address tax competition in the same way that the other methods would. So until all these questions can get ironed out, we, we don't know whether this project will be a success, but it, this is all happening with a background of digital services tax proliferating. Mm -hmm. you know, there, yeah. was a, there was a lot of uh, a, a big loud fight between the U.S. and France over their digital services tax, and the French have agreed not to collect on it while this OECD process is going along. But if the OECD can't come to an agreement, then these digital services taxes are going to be something that we're probably going to be that are probably going to be out there for for the foreseeable future. Well, very challenging, and, and I mean a, a big issue globally, obviously, and as everybody kind of sort of uh, you know tries to figure out how to divide up the pie. I guess you would say, right? And and um, if uh, you were going to go out and you know what we're here in February, obviously, right? But looking out to because when they said 2020, they just the goal is 2020, so I, mm -hmm. we'll say December. What do you think at this point in time? Because there is so much uncertainty. Do you think it's going to get pushed out, or, or where, where, are we, where are we heading here? I don't really have a crystal ball for this thing. Yeah. I, I look at it as I know that the OECD is still targeting getting this done in 2020 as we're sitting here now. Yeah. Whether that is a realistic possibility, I don't know. I look at all these all these interesting questions that they have to be able to answer and they have to get to a consensus on them by the end of the year. And, you know, they even have to continue to address what, what does the safe harbor, what would the safe harbor situation look like? And uh, adding that into the challenges that were already there in the original document. And they just, they have a lot of work that needs to get done. And it's possible there could be a breakthrough. We don't know what the future holds there. Well, at the very least, It'll be an exciting year for, for you, I'm sure, and, and your team as you're tracking this and reporting on it and, and so forth. They're keeping us very busy with really interesting stories. Certainly. Is there one area maybe that is either you find the most fascinating or that you find also, and these would be different ones probably, you know, maybe some confusion on or misunderstanding when you, when you talk about the, the overall concept. When you're, Mostly I'm looking at from the U.S. perspective, when you're talking to, to others in, in, uh, from the U.S. perspective. Well, I would say that the, the the global minimum tax is something that's that's both familiar and different at the same time. It, it's uh, sort of like the global intangible low tax income provision of the TCJA, mm -hmm. but depending on how it gets determined, like what what the actual rules end up being underneath it, it could wind up being a very different animal. And the other side of that is while it does apply a minimum tax. A lot of the concern has been about uh, companies not paying tax in other jurisdictions, but making it a global minimum tax might not actually address that concern. Mm -hmm. It'll make sure that it's taxed somewhere, but the end result could be it being taxed back in the U.S., which doesn't 
address the concerns that the UK campaigners were raising and are continuing to raise about companies not paying tax in their jurisdictions. Mm. A lot of this has been the tax people look at these at, at these outcomes of, of what companies are doing and they say, well, that's what the rules say. You know, the, you know, some companies might be pushing the boundaries of the rules, but ultimately if they were pushing them too far, then the tax authority would push back. Mm-hmm. So a lot of the, the outcomes that we're, that we're getting to an individual looking at it as a non-tax person, this seems unjust. You have a large multinational like Google operating in the United Kingdom, and they see this massive operation in the United Kingdom. And a few years back, all of their sales were being booked in Ireland. And that doesn't seem right. And in the local press, they refer to how much revenue Google is earning in the UK and how little they're paying in taxes. And this whole project is meant to sort of alleviate that, you know, the concerns that arose from that environment. But I'm left to wonder what kind of consensus agreement can be reached that will produce a result that non-tax people will accept as being the just result. Mm, And that is a sort of secondary challenge to just reaching an agreement, but also reaching an agreement that will be stable because it will be understood by everyone as being the best outcome. A a tricky divide there, right? Because it's so so political. It's such a hot potato from that perspective. And then getting non-tax people to understand some of these, the the nuances of this, this is is, uh, particularly challenging. Well, as, as we mentioned, you also host a podcast about taxes, Tax Notes Talk. I'll ask you this because I get this question a lot, or I guess I'll, I'll get a reaction a lot of times. Mm-hmm. I won't share mine just yet. But uh, when you tell somebody, you know, you introduce yourself and say, I, I host a podcast about taxes, what's the reaction you get? Uh, there's there's two possible reactions. If I'm talking to a tax person, it's, oh, where can I find that? Because, mm-hmm. you know, oftentimes they're either being polite or actually interested. A non-tax person is usually looking for a way to extricate themselves from the conversation as quickly as possible. Yeah. Because I think there's a there's a double edge there where it's it's tax and it's I'm telling you about my podcast. Yeah. Yeah. So I tend to I tend to hold back from doing that uh, a little bit. But when I do bring it up and if I uh, if I if I gauge the reaction, if I'm getting a positive reaction from the person, for a tax person, I will point, point them to in the direction of an episode where I think they'll be interested in it. You know, let's say they're interested in guilty. Well, I've got I've got episodes on guilty. I can point them in the direction of that. Or if they're a state practitioner, I've got some I've got some good stuff there. I can point them at that. If they're a non-tax person and I'm talking to them, uh, we have a few episodes where we are a little bit looser. Mm-hmm. We did a, a history podcast with uh, with one of our columnists, Joe Thorndike, that we called Drunk Tax History. There's a fair amount of discussion about taxes and alcohol in the U.S. Yeah, yeah. And, it's and a great it episode, a, by the way. Oh, that's, that's, I probably, appreciate it. that's probably my favorite. Oh, I appreciate it. As a listener it. of the podcast. Yeah. Um, and, and so I'll point a non-tax person to that one and say, mm-hmm. look, it, it's, not all, it's not all wonky how this reg interacts with that reg kind of stuff. So we, we try to have a, a little bit for everyone. We're mostly aimed at the practitioner level where they're interested in getting into the weeds about stuff. Yeah. But we do also have uh, a certain amount of stuff where we, we like to – to make it a, a, approachable for for a general audience. Yeah, well, those are, those are great great ways to respond to that because you're right. Mm-hmm. You, kind of knowing who the audience is uh, really really depends on whether yeah you almost have have to laugh it off like oh yeah I do that I, I host a <laughs> podcast about taxes or it's truly interesting. So one of the unintended benefits I've realized of hosting a podcast about taxes, basically what you just mentioned is saying well oh you're interested in guilty well, you know we can maybe I can send you somewhere on that or being able to help even in areas that aren't necessarily ones that are in my lane I can go and you know. I, I've got an episode for that. It's it's great, you know? Mm-hmm. So uh, what was the genesis of and, and 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 how did Tax Notes Talk come to exist? I'll go back 50 years. Okay. I'll, I'll try to make it happen quickly, though. Okay. Uh, Tax Analyst, the, the parent company here, is a nonprofit, and we were founded 50 years ago to increase transparency in tax. At the time, it was about getting letter rulings out of the, out of the IRS, and uh, I'll elide past that because that's a, there's a long history involved in that. And uh, today... We have a bunch of subscription publications that are, are common among tax practitioners. But we're also making an effort at, at outreach and, and, and educating the public to, to an extent. So the podcast is part of a, a, a larger move where we're getting more engaged in social media. We've opened up a, an opinions page that is, that is open to the public. And most recently, um, we're opening up our, our code and regs database 
to the general public. We currently have a beta version of it up on our website. We're quite proud of how it looks and, and, and the functionality on that. And we're looking forward to letting everybody in and, and see uh, this, this wealth of information that we have available. So the podcast is, is part of this push of educating the public, of being out there and available so that even even non-subscribers can get access to to this information. Well, it's, it's a great podcast. Again, part, I'm, I'm I'm obviously a little biased. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a tax guy. I'm a tax <laughs> geek. I, you know, I, I I find it great. But you do a great job. Yeah, and congratulations. You just Thank recently you. crossed the hundred episode mark. Yeah, and even talk a little about that history. Thank um, you. Yeah. Yes. You know? Thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate the the praise. Uh, you you have a great podcast as well. I would be uh, rude if I if I didn't say say the same thing. I I mean it. Okay. But it would be rude if I didn't say it too. So. I, well, I wouldn't take any offense to it. I, it's, 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 and, it's, and it's perhaps, and I'll, and I'll ask you this about like, you know, becoming goals, because I always said, well, we'll start doing these things. If nobody listens, we'll just stop, I guess. I don't mm. know. But, uh, you know, if I if I had met you, you know, 13 years ago, coming, kind of getting into, getting started, would you have said, you know, someday, Damien, I'm going to host a podcast. Would, would that, had you always I, had this burning desire to host a podcast, I guess? Uh, actually, I came to this project slightly later. I didn't, I wasn't in the initial discussions of creating it. Okay. Gulnar Zaman uh, is... I'm not sure what her title is now anymore. She's actually in charge of this Code and Regs project I mentioned. Ah, okay. Um, she she was the producer on the podcast, and and she was tasked with creating this this thing. We had talked a bit about it, and I uh, I am a an avid podcast listener, and I was talking to her about some of the some of the things that they need to think about while they're putting this together. You know, some of my you know, just the things that I picked up listening to to podcasts I like versus ones that I that I think need to improve. As we were talking and continuing to talk about these things, she asked me to try uh, hosting uh, one of our test episodes. Hmm. It seemed to, to – it just seemed to work out that way. I mean I'm very happy to do it. I had actually proposed maybe doing something like this in the past but it kind of lost interest in that when I, when I became uh, an editor-in-chief and had kind of a full plate going. But uh, yeah, it just sort of organically happened where we, were, we, we decided the, as an organization that we wanted to go in this direction and have – have this this presence. I lucked into it. A lot of fate in my story. Yeah, there's a lot uh, of just sort of there's random a events. Theme here of, of fate uh, and, and random yeah, events. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't say you just stumble through, but I do. I do end up putting myself in the right place at the right time uh, on occasion. Yeah, and uh, and so it just happened that uh, that that it worked out. The test episode uh, went pretty well, and we were able to develop this podcast into a, uh, a thing that we could all be proud of. I did present a challenge to our engineer, Derek Squires here, who had to spend a good portion of the early part of the podcast trying to get my voice to stop bouncing off the walls. <laughs> uh, if you go back to some of the very earliest recordings, I'm echoey. I cause a lot of echoes. And so he did a lot of work to, to put fabric up around me before we had the, the studio built out yeah. uh, to, to make things work. It was a great process of collaboration with with Golnar, and now uh, Paige Jones has taken over as the as the producer. She does a great job of, of of keeping me in line, knowing when I have to record with somebody so that I can be ready for it. I don't know. You could have even had some fun with that. You know, the, the, the booming voice of tax or something <laughs> bouncing off the walls. But it is pretty interesting. And, and maybe you did this as well with coming up on. You know, as you as you got to hundredth episode, you go back and listen to some of the earlier stuff and just how the approach changes. Oh. And your you know, oh, don't go back. Uh, yeah, no, I, I've, I've learned. I've learned. <laughs> I, don't, I don't. I don't go back. I go forward because I. You know, uh, and we were even before we sat down to to, to have this. Uh, interview, even sharing that, like, I don't particularly like listening to my own voice. And mm -hmm. so that's been an interesting learning process from this as well. So, yeah, yeah, I've gotten over that part, though. There was an incident uh, a, a few months back uh, where we were preparing an episode and, and there some error in the link that got sent. The wrong, ver the wrong episode got sent out as we're about to post this episode. And I clicked on it just to hear how it sounded. And I... I must have gone pale white. I I was I was horrified by the way I sounded, and it took a few minutes to realize it was an old episode. Ah, it was okay. It was an episode with a with a delivery I was using that I I am I am not happy with. I don't know if you ever experienced this, but uh, in in my early recording, uh, if I had a script in front of me, I read it as fast as I could. Uh huh. Uh huh. Because uh, it feels it felt to me like if I slowed down, I'd stumble. It's like running downhill. Yeah. And so I had this tendency to just talk way too fast. Yeah, yeah. And I, I was able to beat that out of myself over over the months. But having heard that recording, it reminded me of how far I've come from that 
Uh, I can't say that I'm, I am I, I learned all the lessons, but I learned that one as well as I possibly can. Well, that's great. You know, we're obviously had the opportunity to be on your podcast as well. And, mm-hmm. and we just got done with that interview. And, and I felt like I was uh, maybe reckoning back to some of that where I'm like, I'm just, I'm going a thousand miles an hour over here. It's, it's, it's a very different thing being the person that's being asked the questions of versus the person that's asking the questions. So, Absolutely. So yeah. it's, it's interesting. Yeah. So I don't know. Maybe we'll, maybe I'll listen to it kind of the same thing. If like, wait a minute, that's, that's old Damien. What's, what's he doing <laughs> back here? He's going too fast again. But uh, I don't know. So what's maybe one thing that you've learned from hosting the podcast or, you know, in those hundred episodes? One of the biggest takeaways is you never know what like you have a sense of what people are going to be interested in, but you never really know until you post the episode. Hmm. So you you guess, you put something out, you see how it goes. I mean, when we first started out, uh, we were we were looking at it as, all right, we'll do this every other week. We'll see if we can keep it interesting. We hope maybe somebody will listen to it. And within a couple of years, we're now weekly. We end up with more things to talk about than we can possibly fit in. It's fascinating to to look to see which episodes have the most people listening to them. I'll have an episode where I'm like, oh, this is the most fascinating thing ever. And we're putting this out there. This is going to be great. And then you find out that, meh, yeah, nobody mm-hmm. cares. And then you have another episode that'll be a sleeper. It's like, oh, we, we 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 put this one together on a subject that's that's sort of interesting. We expect to to to, to hit at a normal level. Yeah. And it goes crazy. And there's a there's a lot more interest in it than you were expecting. You know, it might just be that the guest said something that people found really fascinating and they people started passing passing it around and saying, oh, you need to listen to this guy. The lesson, I suppose, is you don't know everything. You you don't know what's going to speak to people, what what people are going to be most interested in. But take the lesson from them, but just and know that you're going to be surprised. No, oh, it's it's interesting. I, I think that that's probably Something I enjoy. Uh, one of the things I enjoy most about putting together the, the, a podcast is is again watching the people for the reaction. But it is also it's it's the most challenging, but yet fascinating aspect of it because I have had that exact same experience for like <laughs> this is going to be great, and then it's just like yeah, nobody was really all that interested. And so, but that's but I look at that as part of the challenge of saying okay, well yeah, you learn from it. You, mm-hmm. you, you kind of find the theme. So yeah, no, that's that's uh, it's it's pretty interesting. Kind of have a similar experience there, but. Uh, uh, you know, I, I appreciate you kind of sharing all of kind of your career, what it's like to to work in the space, to, you know, have followed all these exciting areas, uh, even with lectures about the VAT and, and charts. <laughs> what advice would you have for somebody, maybe that's starting out or again at any point in their career for a successful career on, in reporting and about tax? The main thing is be curious. Don't say, oh, that's an area of tax. I don't, eh, that area of tax isn't interesting. No, you just haven't found the interesting thing about that area of tax yet. Hmm. As I said, in VAT, it's Pringles. It's, it's a good one. There's always going to be something in there that you can find fascinating. Yes, you'll have to do the work a day covering the other aspects of it, but there's going to be something there that, that, that you can have the occasional really fun time covering. You know, the other thing, that, especially for somebody coming from a legal background, is from a legal background, you really want to be the expert. You, you, you really want to be the expert when you're talking to somebody. But a lot of the job is talking to people and getting them to tell you their thoughts on the thing. And so you you have to come to it as, as being, I may know or think I know the answer to this question, but I'm going to ask this question in a way that betrays no knowledge on my part. Because even if it's an explanation of something I already know and I've already explained 14 times, hearing somebody else explain the same thing is going to help me the next time I have to write a story about that subject. Mm-hmm. because yeah. otherwise I might just keep writing the same text over and over and over again. But to hear somebody else talk about it, that will inform me. I mean, I'm not, I'm not going to rip them off entirely, but I'm going to use their their approach to it the next time I want to understand it and explain it to someone else. The, the asking questions where you're, where you're not betraying your own knowledge, I find are the, some of the most fascinating because you can learn a different perspective on something you thought you knew. Your, your advice about you, you maybe haven't found your right angle yet, but I just feel like there's, there's there's so many different avenues you can go down, areas you can explore. You're applying it. You're you're learning about. It, you're hearing from other people. It's just such a dynamic area, uh, tax. And so I, I feel like your yeah your advice is just perfect. And that's that's part of the reason why I think a career in tax, whether it's reporting or or preparing tax returns or consulting on it. I mean, it's just I always tell people in you know in college or whatnot that are asking about you know what should I do. I, if if you're heading down that tax road, I think you're on the right road. 
you know, whatever it might be. So I, so I really appreciate that, but yeah, no, thank you for a, for the opportunity to be on your podcast, doing the, the simultaneous release thing here is, uh, is something I'm, I'm excited about, uh, but thank you for that. And thank you for sitting down and, and sharing on this topic. Cause I, I know from those that I talk to and listeners that we have there, they're always very interested in different, again, what, what can I do with tax and, and how can I learn more? And, and your perspective was, was great. So I really appreciate it. Well, thank you for coming out to Falls Church and uh, it's been great talking to you. I'd like to once again thank Dave and the TNT Tax Notes team for the great work that they do and for hosting our back-to-back interviews at their studio in Falls Church, Virginia. Congratulations again on your 100-plus episodes. Looking forward to the next 100. As you know, we simply love hearing from listeners at Simply Tax, and it'd be great if you would let us know what you think of the podcast by dropping us an email at simplytax at bkd.com, leaving us a rating and review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts, and connecting with us on social media. You can find me out on Twitter, where I tweet about tax at Damian Martin CPA. On Instagram, where I post about my life at the intersection of tax and being a dad at Tax Dad. On YouTube, by subscribing to our Simply Tax YouTube channel and out on LinkedIn. I'm Damian Martin, and thank you for listening. The information contained in this episode of Simply Tax is based on data available as of the date of its release. BKD is under no obligation to update this information if changes occur. Applying this information to your specific situation requires careful consideration of all facts and circumstances. Any information provided is not to be considered as tax, legal, or financial advice. Please consult your tax advisor before acting on any matters covered.